by the Muslim platform. Uh, this will be part of our Muslim families uh, series. Inshallah, the topic today is raising excellent children. Uh, and while I have your attention, and, uh, and for those who have come in previous weeks and those who are new, uh, we wanted to bring an attention, uh, your attention to uh, the appeal uh, that the fundraising appeal that we currently have, inshallah, to help some of our development and uh, career initiatives that we have in the pipeline. So inshallah, the details of how you can give will be posted in the, in, in the chat. Um, just so that throughout um, the lecture, if you wanted to take a, a moment uh, to support, you can. Uh, so, but uh, inshallah, what we'll do now is hand over to our lecturer for today. Uh, he's not a stranger to most of us, uh, Ustaz uh, Tawfiq Abdul Salam. So inshallah, the topic today is raising excellent children, a practical approach. That's raising excellent children, the practical approach. So inshallah, we ask that Allah allow us all to benefit uh, from today's lecture and uh, implement the lessons learned in our own families. So without further ado, I hand over to our dear Ustaz. Inna alhamdulillahi na'hmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa nasta'di wa na'udu bihi min shururi anfusina wa sayyi'ati a'malina innahu ma ya'dihi Allahu fala mudilla lah wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين. We thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala الواحد القهار the merciful God who had given us opportunity to be able to congregate on this platform again. To learn one or two things that are very important to the life of the Muslims, and that is the raising of our children, um, how we want to raise children, how the Muslim are raising their children, and some tips from the Sunnah and from the Salaf on how we can better ourselves in the skills of uh, raising our children, inshallah ta'ala. This topic is an important aspect of our life because we think that when people get married, the next thing they want to do is to have children. However, children can be adornments, they can be blessings, they can be the adornment of beauty for, for us in this dunya, the way Allah Ta'ala mentions uh, in the Quran. Uh, Allah mentions you know when you have money and you have children they are adornment of this world they are adornment of this world if you check surah al-kaf verse 46 you will read that from that but know for sure my dear listeners may Allah bless me and you that the same God also mentioned in surah al-anfal Quran chapter 8 verse 28 and he says وَعَلَمُوا and go and know for surely your wealth and your children fitna they are trials and tribulations for you they are what they are trials so how can your children be a domain for you they can only be a domain for you when those children are solihin they are good children excellent children they will be test for you when they are gay or solih when they are not good. Because it is only the good children that you will raise and they will know how to pray for you when you check out, when you are dead. The bad children won't know. So is there guidance from Islam on how we raise good, excellent children? And that's the point. Because the ones that are dormant, they are the ones that they grow up as kurotayun, as coolness for the eyes of the parents. Not the ones that grow up and they do not know, number one, the tawheed of God, the oneness of God, and they are thugs, and they are creating facade on the earth, and they are not good children, okay? And we're going to come back there. So know that the way children can be beauty and adornment for us is the same way they can be fitna for us. Now, parenting, what is parenting? 
you know, before you have children, you need to understand the psychology, you know, in terms of what we mean by parenting. Parenting is the process of caretaking, is the process of educating through which you as a parent help a child to grow from a dependent child into an independent adult. Okay, let me repeat that. Parenting is the process where you as the dad and mom, you go through the process of caretaking and educating a child where you help that child to grow and move from a dependent child that is always dependent on the parent to uh, an independent adult. That process is a process that is well-defined in our way of life as Muslims, okay? And it, it is so clear that there are so many principles that we can learn, and we're going to come to that very soon. There are so many principles that you as a Muslim dad and mom can actually learn, maybe today, maybe another time, or there are some mindsets that we need to you know, change into how do you raise excellent children? How do you raise good children? Isallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam he gave us a lot of principles that we're going to be looking into, which I would like us to pay attention. There are different principles which we are going to be paying attention to. Number one is we want to prepare the parents, especially the mom, to make sure they are ready before they have the children. Or maybe they've had the children already to that they are ready to learn more knowledge about how they can improve their parenting skills. And also, we want to teach them the principle of preparing the environment in which they want to raise those kids. Isallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he mentions, kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun anin rahiyate. All of you are shepherds, and all of you will be asked how you direct your flocks. So the principle number one is that, the principle number one is that, the children that you raise, they can be, good for you or they can be bad for you if you want the children to be good there are steps principles knowledge that you can follow and if you're not following them the result of it will be the fitna because on the day of resurrection when those children come and they have no religiosity no value in the sight of allah and they have incurred actually a lot of sins for you as the dad as compared to children that when you die when you go into your graves, they know the prayers to say for you. They know the, the, the charity to make on your behalf. They know how to bath you when you die. They know how to put perfume on you. They know, how, they know what they need to do as compared to the children that when you go, they don't even know what to do. Children that are well-mannered. That's the first point. The second point is, all oh, you parents who are listening right now, you are the cause of him being whatever he wants to be. You can make or mar your children. The second point is you are the reason for the behaviors that your children are having. You are responsible for who they are right now. Why did we say that? He said it. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. He said, All of you are shepherds. You are someone who is leading to lead the flock and all of you will be asked according to the way you direct your flock so the direction of his behavior the direction of his mindset and thinking is from you and in another beautiful hadith he said you will lead you all children that they have birth to today, all of them, they are all born upon the fitro. Every new child that comes to this world were all born upon knowing that God Almighty is one. It is the parents, it is the dad or the mom who makes this child a Christian or makes this child a sun worshiper or an ogun worshiper or a keibada worshiper or a Muslim. Why? Because the dad and the mom were the one that welcome him and they're the one that teaches him, you know, how to worship God. 
if we were to be a Muslim parent, they are the person who taught this child how to worship the only one God and the creator of the heavens and the earth. So the second principle is that you as a parent, you are the reason why he talks the way he talks because he's been watching you as a child. You are the reason why he behaves the way he behaves. You are the reason why he does what he does. So all parents, beware. Do not destroy the confidence of your children. So for example, many parents will be like, you know, you go to some houses and you see the mom forcing their child who is not eating. You have to eat. Sit down there. Stand up there. They control these children overly. And at the, in the essence, you will see that, that those children grow up with personality of, you know, over, 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 being overly controlling when they, they grow up and meet people. The fact that it's not eating does not mean the food is not good. Okay? Find out about the psychological being background behind this rejection and his complaints. Always encourage him. If, if it's not eating, it's not eating. If you want to eat, then eat. If he wants to eat, he's going to eat. If he feels hungry, you would eat. The only thing you need as a parent is you need to guide him from being a dependent person to you to becoming an, an, an independent adult. So another principle is that we want to make sure that parents today, we understand all this concept and we follow it. But before we go there, let us look at how the Prophet alayhim salam or rahmah how did they raise children? How, what was their interaction? What are the examples we can give ourselves, practical examples we can give about the Prophet? Allah Ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Azab, Quran 33, verse 7, Allah Ta'ala says, Fasbir kama sobar ulul azmi min rusul, wala tastajal lahum. And be patient the way the five determined prophets have been prayed. Patience. Who are the five determined prophets? Who are they? Huh? Who are those prophets? So the examples of the five major determined prophet, number one is Nuh alayhi salam. Number two is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Number three is Musa alayhi salam. Number four is Isa ibn alayhi salam. And the last of the Ulul Azm is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. These five major prophets, we try to look at how did they interact with their children? How did they interact with the kids around them? So let's quickly look at Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, we remember, he had an ark that he built. He built an ark. And he called his son. He said, Ya Buni, my son, er come upon the ark with us. Do not be among the disbelievers. What did the son say to the father? He said, mm, so we in a jubilee. I am going to run to the mountain. The mountain is going to protect me from the, from the water. But the father knows that nothing could prove, protect his son except the rahmah of Allah on that day. But the boy refused. He didn't follow his father. The son of Noah did not follow Noah. Don't forget, Noah was a prophet of God. His son did not obey him. What happened to a father who wanted, who knew that this is a destruction coming to my son? What would the father do? The father would want to protect the son. The father wanted to. What did he do? When he saw that that boy was disobedient, he turned back to Allah. He turned back to Allah. My Lord. My son. My son is from my family. Save my son. He's from my family. Save him with us. And he prays. He asked Allah. And your word is true, Allah, in order for Allah to save the son of, of Noah. What did Allah Ta'ala say? Allah Ta'ala says, Ya Noah, O Prophet Noah, inna hu lisa min ahlik. That your son is not from your family. Inna hu amalu gayru soleh. And that's where we understand that there are some children, they are gayru soleh. They are not good children. The lesson from the relationship of Noah and his son is a lesson that we need to take away. That number one point is that only Allah can guide our children. So the lesson is call upon Allah if you want an excellent child. Number one point, call upon Allah. What did Nuhu say? Nuhu did not believe in his parenting skills. He did not believe in the amount of parenting books he had read. He called on Allah. 
So, oh parents, your children are not listening to you. They are being disobedient. Call on Allah the way Nuh alayhi salam. Call on Allah. Make dua. Warn your children. Warn them. Make clear the message of Allah, the especially tawheed to your children. Make dua for them. Make Let them know how to take those dua by themselves. Let them know the difference between Islam and Kufr. Let them know about Tawheed, all the component of Tawheed. Teach them the oneness of God. Never think, never think, all oh parents who are listening, never think that you can guide them. And only Allah can guide. That is point number one from the story of Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. What about Ibrahim alayhi salam and the children? What lesson can we learn? When you look at the Quran, when Yaqub was on the sick bed where he was dying, he asked his children, who are you going to worship? He, he made clear before he died. Who are you going to worship? He made sure he explained to them that you must not worship anything. Make sure you submit to the will of Allah. Do not worship anything. Ibrahim Yaqub, he made that clear to his children. In fact, you will know that when you read more stories about Ibrahim alayhi salam, you will find that, that you know, he was able to convey the message of Tawid, not only to his children, but also to his elderly, the father. If you remember the story where he caught all the small idols and then he put the axe on the neck of the bigger idol just to show people that whether you like it or not, only Allah was meant to be worshipped. So Noah, Ibrahim, they established Tawheed with their children. They established the oneness of God with their children. The third of them, brothers and sisters, may Allah Ta'ala bless you and myself, is Musa alayhi salam. Musa, he dealt with Yusha ibn Nun. If you remember the story in Surah Al-Kaf, Okay, he went out with the boy. He went out with Yusha. And when he went out with Yusha, what happened? What happened between Yusha and Musa? He went out with him. Maybe one lesson to take away from that is that, oh, fathers who are listening, go out with your children. Do not leave them at home, especially the, the male children. Spend quality time with your children. Take them out with you. Musa also swear on the, didn't swear on the, on the boy. When the boy forgot the fish, if you remember the story, he forgot the sweet. He said to the boy, He did not rebuke the boy for forgetting the fish. He treated his mistake lightly. We are coming back to that point. And that is Musa alayhi salatu was salam. What happened between Jesus and even, even Yusha? you know, the, the, the story of Jesus, alayhi salam, Isa. Isa came after Yusha. In the Bible, we call Yusha, we call him Joshua, right? Because it was taught by Musa. But Isa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentioned something specifically about Yusha, Joshua. He said, inna shamsha, inna shamsa, lam tu'bas ala basharin illa li Yusha. Allah ta'ala has not withheld the sun for anyone apart from Yusha, Joshua. Allah withheld the sun from him. Why? There was a day Yusha, Joshua was traveling to Beitul Maqdis to, to perform jihad. And he was getting dark. And then he looked at the sun, and then he looked, and he looked at the sun, and then he looked, and he says to the sun, Anti mahrumatun wa anna mahmur. Allah umma absiha. He said to the sun, you are sacred. And I'm part of one of the sacred work of Allah. Allah umma absiha o Allah, hold the sun. And Allah withheld the son. This is a special treatment for Joshua, right? This is a special lesson that was related about Joshua as a young boy. Now, the story of Joshua or even Jesus, alayhi salatu was salam, as a child was miraculous when the mother of Jesus, Mary, was accused of adultery when he brought a baby from the mihrab, from outskirts of the town to the city. When people were accusing him of lewdness and adultery what did what did what did Maryam did Maryam pointed to Jesus and said ask ask him and Jesus spoke he spoke as a three-day-old baby and that's the first miracle Jesus performed 
first miracle that he performed, according to the Quran, was that Jesus spoke as a baby. According to the Quran, he turned the water into wine. But how do we know the Quran is more correct? Because the Quran was revealed for, by Allah to Angel Gabriel. The Quran was revealed by Allah to Angel Gabriel. Okay? So, the last of the Ulul Azmi is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam. How did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did deal with the, with the children who are going to come there? I call him the children psychologist. He knew how he dealt with the children. He knew how he managed the emotion of the children. He knew how he played with the children. Oh, parents of today, I want you to follow me in understanding the interaction of the five major prophets with the children as examples. I want us to come back now to 10 golden points on how to raise a child of excellence. 10 golden points. And I'm going to run through this point quickly. Number one point is that recognize your child as a person. Try to give recognition to your child as a personality, as a whole person on himself. I'll give you an example from the children's psychologist. When I say the children's psychology, I mean the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One day, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting in the majlis. And there were kibar, there were elderly people in the majlis, in the sitting. And to this right hand side was a young boy, a gulam, a young boy on his right hand side. And at that point, the milk was offered, was brought to the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know the sunnah is that when something is brought to him, he always distributes among the people, among the majlis. And he does not just distribute, he starts his distribution from the right hand side, immediate right hand side, not the left hand side. He starts always from the right. To the immediate right of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a young boy. In front of him were elderly, elderly people within the community. What did he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did? What did he do? He took the milk and then he turned to the boy on the right hand side and they asked him for permission. Please, oh young man, give me permission. Allow me to give the milk to the elderly people first because he wanted to respect the elderly, but he did not want to disrespect the young boy. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam sought permission from the young boy. What did the young boy say? What did he say? He said, la wallahi, I am not going to allow you, O prophet of God, to give my right to someone else. <laughs> Subhanallah. And what did he sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam did? What did he do? He gave the milk to the boy. Point number one. Recognize your child. Recognize your child as a person. Let's, let's, let's th think about that. How do you think? How do you think that boy self-esteem would have been? By the Prophet Sallam recognizing him as a person. How do you think his confidence never will be? Do you not think his confidence never will shoot up? Do you not think he would forever be able to brag and say, we are the one that the Prophet Sallam gave the milk to for the first one. Do you not think that will make him a confident man? As opposed to the African ways or the Nigerian way of upbringing, when a child asks for his rights, the next thing is, Bamu, <laughs> who is your father? You are so disrespectful. You are this and that. It's not disrespectful. The Sunnah is the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the Sunnah. When a when the right of a child is meant to be given to the child, we don't take the right from the child. So point number one, all parents who are listening to me, recognize your child. Do not put them down as a person. If you look at your children at home, the young ones, you will see that when you scold them, when you abuse them, you will see their face frowned naturally by default. What that child is telling you is, dad, mom, I am a person. Please recognize me. Dad, mom, I am a person. Please make me feel important. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, anytime you see your child, always remember this thing. Just assume they have a chain on their neck and it's written boldly on their chest. Daddy, mommy, make me feel important. Making your child feel important. It's not spoiling your child. It is recognizing your child as a servant of God and as a person who did that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that. What's another example? He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he named a new gulam, a new child, 
he would give those child, those children, he would give them kunya out of respect for a newborn baby. Abu, Abu Abdullah, Abu Mas'ud, Abu this, Abu that. He would give respect to that child by giving them kunya, apart from their ism, apart from their names. Two point there. All parents who are listening, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, recognize your child. Do not beat them down. Another example under this recognition of your children is the beatings that the African parent do, especially on the face. Know, all you who are listening, that it is forbidden in our way of life to slap your child on the face. You can beat him somewhere else, maybe on the finger, or the, but not on the face. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no person should beat someone on the face. Do not mutilate the face. It is haram. All this tribal mark that we had, all this beating on the face, it is all haram. That's point number one. Point number two is that the Prophet used to give task to children to make them feel important. Ubaid ibn Kab, he pulled a companion called Qais ibn Abbas from the first row in the mosque when he got into the mosque. Qais, radiallahu an, he got very upset. And after the prayer, what did Ubaid do? Ubaid said to him, Qais, and said, do not get upset. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had given me order to always be in the front row so I can correct his recitation. And you know, in the popular hadith, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, istakhbarul Qur'an min arba, fabadda min Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, wa Ubaid ibn Ka'b, he mentioned the name of the people that the people should learn the Qur'an from. Ubaid ibn Ka'b was one of them. And he told Ubaid to always be in the front row. Ois, Ibn Abbas was already in the front row. Ubaid pulled him out so that he can replace himself in the front row because the Prophet Islam ordered him. Now, what do you think? When Ubaid finished, he prayed for the boy. He sat with the boy and said, May Allah not make you get upset. Do not get upset because I do not mean to oppress you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the one that do what? That ordered me to be in the first row. The taking of excuse from a child, from an elderly person, do you not think it will make that boy feel better, not feeling oppressed? And that is why we need to recognize, not just recognize, we need to communicate to our children why we are ordering them to do things. Number one point, we recognize their personality. We also communicate with them when we are doing something. To some people, they were thinking, ah, are you not spoiling the child? It's not spoiling the child. If it is about spoiling the child, Allah, Allah, wouldn't have raised excellent children. Because of time, the second point in raising excellent children is big up, big up your children. Praise your children. Praise them. Do not call them a failure. Do not call them a failure. Praise them. You know, in, in, the, in, in our culture, in the Yoruba land, we have Oriki. The concept of Oriki is not haram, especially you know, when, you, when it is something that you are chanting to praise the, your, your children. They are what the psychologists, children psychologists, they are what they call positive affirmations. Positive affirmations, they are like dua, like prayer. You are a successful son. You, who oh you, Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah, the one who had memorized the Quran, you know, raising them, bigging them up. That boy or that girl will grow up with the confidence that yes, I am this with confidence, with enough self-esteem. Remember, almost Sulaim radiallahu anha brought Hassan Anas bin Malik to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umus Sulaim brought Anas to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know Anas was the boy who was in the service of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 10 years. Umu Sulaim said, Inna Anasa the kiyum. When, he met, when she met the Prophet Sallam, the first thing the mother of Anas said to the Prophet Sallam said, in the Anas, Anas, my son, the key is an intelligent boy. And what did the Prophet Sallam said? He smiled and his teeth was showing. Meaning that Isa Allah Wasallam was confirming the positive affirmation from the mouth of the mother of Anas, Umm Sulaim. So, dear parents, big up your children. Say positive things to them. Say good words to them. Do not call them negative words. 
do not use negative words. Do not cause them. Do not say anything backward to steal their confidence away. The second, the third point of raising excellent children as a culture is do not make distinctions among your children. We all pray we want more children. Some of us, we have children. We want more children. Do not show love for one child over the other. Make sure you are balanced. If you remember in the story of Yusuf, the story of Yusuf is that um, Yusuf and his brother, when there was a preference for Yusuf, it caused enmity, jealousy, and envy between his brother towards Yusuf, and they plotted against him. So do not allow, yes, it is allowed to love one child over the other, but do not show it among them. There are different reasons to love one child or a wife over the other. The Prophet loved Khadija radiallahu anha, and you know, in front of Aisha radiallahu anha. And even when Khadija had gone, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was slaughtered, and he would distribute the meat to the family and friends of Khadija. And in the presence of Aisha, he would even say, Inna Allah razaqani hubwa, un Allah ta'ala provided me with the love of Khadija. There's nothing wrong, as long as you know how to balance it. But know that you are not allowed as a parent with two children, with three children, to show love for one of your children in the presence of the other. Remember the story of Numan ibn Bashir. He came to, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, my son Numan, ask me about something. I gave him a garden out of my property. You know, Bashir ibn Numan, I mean, Numan ibn Bashir was telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I gave one of my beautiful garden, my property, to my son. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, did you give the same thing to other children of yours? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And the man said, no. And what did he say? He said, ittaqillaha wa'adilu fi awladikum. Fear Allah and be just among your children. Do not show, even if you love one over the other, do not show it. Show to them that you all love all of them. The fourth point, which is are things that we want to run through quickly for parents as tools to take away from this call, is that please know, all parents, how to defend your children. Defend your children. And the reason why we say defend your children is, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, defended Fatima, radiyallahu anha. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Fatima ta bid'atu minni. Fatima is a flesh of me. Whoever makes her happy makes me happy. Whoever upset her upset me in defense for Fatima. Radiallahu anha. Usama bin Zaid. His father was Zaid bin Haritha. Usama was a dark in complexion companion. And her mom was also dark because the mom was dark. So Usama was dark. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam choose Usama as the leader over some Arabs in those days, at the age of 17. Usama bin Zaid, people saw that he was a young boy at 17, leading elderly people. And not only that, he was dark. He was a black guy among the white, light complexion Arab. And then people started complaining. People started showing, you know, you know, rejection for him. Oh, young boy, dark. How is he going to be our leader? How is he going to be our leader? What did Isa Allahu alayhi wa sallam say to them? He stepped in in defense for Usama bin Zaid. He stepped in and he said, In the the creation of this boy from, from the heavens, Allah Ta'ala had created him to be a leader everywhere he goes. Allah had created him to be a leader everywhere he goes. That's another pointer to let you parent know that there are things, there are skills that are inherent in your children. Find time to know who they are, even though you're not a prophet. You don't know whether your children have been made as a leader. You don't know, but you can identify skills at a younger age. Maybe he likes mathematics. Maybe he likes to write. Maybe he likes, you know, you know, maybe he's a creative person. Allow those creativeness to show by making sure you defend that child of yours. Make sure you keep an eye on things that he knows how to do at a younger age. Number six point, brothers and sisters, because of time, teach him the Quran. Teach your children the Quran. Inna siyamu 
wala Quran yashfa'ani yawm lil 'abdi yawm al why do we say teach the Quran because we know on the day of resurrection surely the fasting and the Quran will intercede for the reciter yawm al so it's going to be a great position for the one who recite the Quran and as parents we want our children to memorize the Quran to know how to recite the Quran with the best of you know rulings of recitation not only reciting the Quran telling educa ed educational stories especially at dining let them know about you know stories of the prophet stories of the companions from the dining teach them the fiqh the understanding of the Islam teach them how to deal with people especially the elders don't say, oh, because you can't prostrate for them, then you have to disrespect them. Show them how the culture is. Teach them the culture of Islam, especially to the women, to our girls. Teach them shyness. Teach them how to be shy. Because without shyness for a woman, what, what is going to remain of her modesty? Isa mentioned, shyness for every religion, there's a, there's a culture. And the culture of Islam is shyness. Number seven point, which is one of the key most important, is that undo his mistakes and help him in correction, in correcting him. Undo his mistakes. No, oh parents, that your children will make mistakes. And you not destroying them or stealing away their confidence at the face of their mistake is the pinnacle, is the point, the engine room of your task as a parent do not destroy them when they make mistakes do not you know scold them in a way that will make them lose their confidence when you you make lighter for him his mistakes so that he doesn't lose his confidence when he performs those mistakes the person allah wasallam used to see anas bunu malik as we mentioned he used to see him make mistakes many times what did he what, what did he do he would grab him at the back he would grab anas at the back and then he would start smiling at him sallallahu alaihi wasallam while your children make mistakes you know you you use the eyes you use the body language you pat him at the back you give him that smile that will make him feel that oh yeah he had made mistakes an intelligent boy and girls will pick that up also if you remember ibn abbas radiallahu an ibn abbas stood on his left and brought him to his right he, he, when they were praying he didn't say oh you don't know where to stand in prayer he was standing on the right side. Isa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought him back to the right side without rebuking him. And that is where I called away the concept of silent leadership. I don't know whether anyone has heard that concept. There's a book called Silent Leadership. I am open be in the Lord that I'm going to rewrite that book for the author. Because the best of examples of silent leadership is from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas got tired during the solar. And it was dose enough. It was dose enough. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would take him by his hair and just wake him up by his hair to help him overcome his weakness. The correction of, of his mistakes. What about the mistake of Usama bin Zaid? Usama bin Zaid, he killed somebody after the person has said the kalima. The Prophet said, ask him and give him the second chance by making him the leader of another army after that, after that mistakes. So do not use the mistakes of your children to destroy or steal away their confidence. Help them grow. Help them learn that they've made mistakes in a way that is not too harsh. Okay? Tell them that, you, you know what, we are doing this together in order to correct them. Make them feel at peace when they make those mistakes. Okay? That is a beautiful point about mistakes. You know when you see the way Allah Ta'ala handles our mistakes? And the way Isa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam undoes the mistakes of people who even committed the kabah here. Then you as a parent, you would have no choice than to come down in coming down in correcting people's mistakes. Remember, the boy who came to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Oh prophet of God, give me the permission to perform zina. Ooh. Imagine the access that that boy had to the prophet of Allah. To the extent that he could go to him, he has the confidence, the heavy chest, to go to him to go ask. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say, who? You asking that question? And then he started beating him. No, he didn't say that. He started asking him questions. And that's another skill. 
the ability to touch the feeling of your children. That is the when you can influence them. The ability to touch the feelings of their children. That is the best point where you can influence. And how do you touch somebody's feeling? By questioning them in a good way. And the person said, I started questioning him. Do you want the same to be done to your mother? The boy said, no. Do you want it to be done to your sister? He said, no. Do you want it to be done to your aunties? He said, no. And then he grabbed the boy's chest. He made dua for him. And Allah Ta'ala healed him of that disease. Oh, parents who are listening, be careful and be gentle how you correct your children. Be conscious that you do not want to steal their confidence away. Correct them in a manner that will build this strong personality in them. The next point, show them love. Kiss them. Call them the queen. Help them about being independent. Help them about that. Show them love. So there's a man who came to Prophet Islam and he asked him, do you kiss your children? And he said, no, he doesn't. And the Prophet Islam said, you need to show mercy to the people on the earth so that the one in the heaven can show mercy upon you. How, how surprising is it that some parents do not even hug their children? They don't even kiss them. They, there's no bond between them. How on earth do you not think when those kids get back to school and the teachers are hugging them, do you not think that they will see those teachers as better and beloved to them rather than yourself? Some parents are too hard. It's too hard to come down to the level of the children. Why being too hard? Why can't you come down to the level of those children and help them do stuff? Help them fix their bicycle if he can't fix it by himself. A system is in solving his difficult assignments if he can't do it by himself. Teach him the spirit of congregation. Do not let them be in their rooms all the time playing games on the iPads. Give him money to give in charity so he can learn how to give. Give him gifts to present to people that come around so he knows that we are in the game, in the process of giving. Do not leave alone in the house. Do not let him just live alone in the house. Let him socialize with other people. Okay? So look at all these ways of correcting children and being part of their process of growth. Number eight point, which is a beautiful point because of time we are, we are rushing through all these points, is the concept of reward and punishment. The reward and punishment. Do not let them be the one to be by themselves in the house. That's what I mean. The reward and punishment. The concept of reward and punishment is number one, you need to reward them immediately when they do good stuff. You don't postpone. You don't say, oh, you passed your GCSE. Don't worry, we are going to give you something. No, 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 no. You promise them if you pass your driving test and your GCSE, we're going to buy you a new iPhone, iPhone, the latest iPhone. Make sure you do not delay that promise of reward. Because in that case, you'll be a lying dad and mom, right? And then the next time you promise them something, they'll be like, mm, dad and mom, they, they've promised many things in the past. They didn't fulfill it. And then you've been in, they won't believe you. The same thing with punishments. Do not delay their punishments if you need to punish them. Yeah, of course, punishments is allowed. So for example, your kids are not praying and they are above the age of seven and 10. Yeah, and they're allowed to be punished. But the punishment should be light and not the one that will break their bones, not the one that will mutilate their body, right? The punishment should be maybe, you know, in a way that we punish people with reward, we withhold the reward. Reward them when only when they deserved to be rewarded and punish them only when they deserve to be punished. But make sure you fulfill your promise in both rewarding and punishing them. If you want to punish your son, you said, I'm, I'm going to kill you today. That is not punishment because that child knows that you are just bluffing. You are not going to kill him. So next time that you are warning him about something, he will just say, oh, that is the that African way of bluffing. Yeah, the last one. So if you want to punish, let them know that this is going to be the punishment and I am going to do it. So for example, there's a rule in the house that boys, you can only play your games between certain hours. If I see anyone playing the games one minute past 9 p.m., I'm going to withdraw the games. And then you saw them 10 minutes past 9 playing the games. So you don't need to tell anybody. You just need to withdraw the game immediately. That is a punishment. They've done well in school. They've come the first in class. And you said to them, if you are the first in the class, I'm going to take you on holiday to Devon. 
Again, on holiday to devil, do not promise him something that you won't be able to fulfill. I'm going to buy you the best of shoes. Do not say all that. I'm going to buy you the best of Nike trainers. Don't give them fake promises that you do not have ability to fulfill. For that child will not take you serious the next time. Only reward is work and not the actions of another. Praise his personality. Do not delay the praise and the punishment. Let him choose the reward and, pun and budget for some time. Just say to him, I have only 20 pounds to spend. What would you like out of that? Okay? Do not overburden him. And I think that's the last statement that we're going to do. Do not overburden him with too much teaching. When we look at the teaching that the, is it the Finland or is it Finland as a country? They have one of the best children education in the world. I think somewhere in Europe, if it is not Finland, another country. And you see that, and Japan as well, you see that their children are excelling because they give them enough breaks, breaks in between learning. Do not overload. They just finished school. They're coming back home. You said, no, no, you're not going to have lunch. You have to start the Quran class. They start the Quran class. Oh, you have to drink water and biscuits and then start the Arabic class. No, when you finish that, then it's the story of Hadith. And when are they going to relax, you know? And those are the effects of overzealousness in parenting, making sure that you balance it out when you want to educate, when you want to uh, uh, say things to them. My brothers and sisters in Islam, because of the time and the question and answer that we want to leave for 10 minutes, we want to say to you, dad and mom, brothers and sisters, potential dad and mom, that the way we raise children in Islam, this is just an introduction to it. The psychology, the psychology of understanding how the children grow, especially when they are becoming teenagers, you know, the hormone in their body start changing. You know, the boy is becoming a teenager. You see that he started growing public hairs. You know, his face becoming changing. His voice changes. His, you know, body changes, especially the girls. They require some different treatment in your support of their upbringing, in the way you balance, you know, them to, to grow. Now, on the final note, is how do we instill with all this soft, silent leadership, how do we ensure that discipline in the house is at the maximum level? Because everything we've told you today is about how we should not be too harsh, how we should not steal their confidence, how we should not pull them down, how we should pick them up. How do we maintain the discipline without going overboard? Yes. The way we maintain discipline is by agreeing rules and regulation for them rules and regulation they know when to do and when not to do stuff in the house by agreeing with them how do we do that by communicating by agreeing like i see you're working in a team so my children they know that daddy only beats only one person is the name of that person is a person who is stupid because they know that i won't beat because beating does not grow a child beating does not do anything to a child more than that it steals away their confidence. Can you not think about how Anas bin Malik was with the Prophet for 10 years and the Prophet did not never say to him, Anas, why did you do this? Anas, why didn't you do this for a good 10 years? Apart from the mercy, personal, merciful personality of the Prophet I can't comprehend you living with a child and not complaining at all. We can't do that. We, are, we would complain. But the way and manners by which we complain has to be focused on not putting those children down, not stealing their confidence, making them strong men on their own. Now, the discipline, to instill the discipline in them, the parent needs to make sure you agree rules and regulation. Before we pray so that, somebody must make Adan. I do need to tell you who made the Adan. Because if somebody makes the Adan, that person makes the Ikoma. Another person becomes the Imam. We have the rules. Oh, we are praying. The comments has been made. Nobody can be doing any other thing. Or oh, even if they're eating. Nobody can do any other thing in their house. We have the rules. Oh, when visitors comes, you are only allowed to greet them. And then when dad and mom are talking to the visitors, what do you do? You move back to your room because maybe they might just confidential thing they want to talk about. There's an agreement. 
when you eat your food and your plate, you know, there are rules according to each family. It's the way we will set those rules. You cannot beat or punish a child that you have not communicated your rules to. The number one step is you have to agree the rules and regulation with them first before reminding them about they're not doing it well. The only time we punish harshly is when a child is overly like a desica and they don't listen. And then we use dua in that area. When we say to Allah, oh Allah, make them children that are coolness of our eyes by making them children that will learn and listen to us. Oh Allah, do not make them children that will not listen to us. So these are all tips that I think we need to balance out. Um, we need to balance out when we are raising our children. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-wahidu al-kuhar, to uh, bless each and every one of us and our children, to make them coolness of our eyes, to make them awladu salihin, that will be a good children to us while we are here on earth and when we go into our graves. May Allah ta'ala make our children to make them, uh, you know, children that are salihin to us. I think we'll allow a few questions, inshallah. Tawfiq al-Qudju. Wassalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feek, Sheikh, for the very informative and very practical session that you've uh, shared with us. May Allah bless you, may Allah reward you, and may Allah allow you to reap the benefits in your own family as well. Okay, so I'm scrolling through the, the comments now to see for questions. You, you, you've managed to answer one of them that came in around how do you balance uh, discipline. Uh, so we have another question here. Some kids only understand punishment by smacking as opposed to words. How best can this be corrected? As so much effort has been put into seating, uh, into seating them down to talk to them. I believe the cane works magic. Mm, okay, I like I like that word. The cane works magic. Yeah, you know, the the honest truth is the cane might not work magic. How do we know this? Because we have research that have shown that each time you beat somebody, a child, what you are doing at that time, you are using force and fear to raise them. It doesn't really. It's and it's a mechanical way of leadership. It doesn't really work. In today's world, it doesn't work. And let me be honest with you. I have been involved in so many families. In fact, there was one elderly, Egmont, you know, this man used to be an ex-soldier from Nigeria. He lives in South London. And I got called by the wife when the police were in their house that this man, this ex-soldier, he used to beat his daughters, three daughters. And he was so used to beating them that when they even grow to the age of teenager and maturity, he was still beating them. So one day, one of the girls, she has been discussing with her friends outside the house that my dad beat me, my dad beat me. And he's been warning them, putting fear in them that they should not tell anyone outside. And the, the friends, they've been teaching her that anytime he does that again, just call the police. They call, they call the police. This man lost the three children. <laughs> To the to the government they collected all the three children when i was called to come and intervene in fact this man would have gone to jail because he harmed those children and there were evidences on their body that shows that they were harmed the way our parents let me say this before we go ahead it's going to be a failure that you raise your children in this country in england in america in canada in australia the way we were raised in nigeria it's a two different completely environment in Nigeria, a father can beat a child, no problem. In this country, if you do it, you will be in trouble. Does Islam allow us to relax beating of children? Yes, there are better ways. In fact, the research have shown, I'm an NLP for the children. The research have shown that beating the children put them in a defensive, agon agonistic mood. They become very defensive. They become agitated. That is not when you change their behavior. The point at which you can change somebody's behavior, it is when you are touching their feelings. And how do you touch somebody's feeling? By asking them question. I brought him. Do you think what you have done today is good? And he will be no. So why did you do it? And then it will keep quiet. 
Do you not think that a child who is a good child from good parent should not be doing this? And you'll be like, yes, I know that. Would you be able to think about this? And then you will be like, yes. Remember, in this environment, in England, America, Dublin, Ireland, Canada, Australia, the children, they go to school where they, want, where they are not beaten. I have seen this word. They, they don't beat them in school. You will see the teachers going on the mat with them like mates, they will kneel in front of them. They will start talking to them. They will start asking them. They will start saying please to them. How do you think that child will be seeing you when he goes out to the school and the teachers are nice to him and then he comes back to the house and you're beating him? What do you think your child will see you as? They will see you as the wicked eye, the bad one. They will see the teachers in school as the good one. What you have done there is you have exchanged your parenthood to the teachers in school. Whereas you're not meant to do that. What you are meant to do is what we have learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he never beat the child. Rather, he used, he used silent leadership. He used behavior change, behavioral change approach to you know, listen to the children. Don't forget, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be pulled by the young girls on the streets. They will have access to him. They will take his hand and they will be dragging him to wherever they want to go. It would, it would stop his tongue out for the children like that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, playing with them. Huh? It would give recognition to the children, recognizing their personality. So beating is not the effective way of raising a child. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Um, last question, Sheikh, or to be fair, there's another one that's come through, but one from YouTube. Um, how do we navigate the dangers of Western educational influences? There's lots of rumors on the exposure to certain modern concepts uh, that are taught in schools that are incompatible with the religion. So how do we navigate that? So, so we are faced with those challenges and that's why we said the practical approach. We're faced with a lot of challenges of how we raise Muslim children in this country as compared to what they go through when they go to the schools. This is an ongoing challenge for Muslim parents in the West in US, in America, in England, and everywhere in the West. Now, the key thing there is establishing the religion in the house and communication of Islamic knowledge in the house. The reason why we say this is basically because we know that there are a lot of contents being taught in schools that are totally un-Islamic. And that's why some parents, they prefer to do homeschooling. And we are not saying we are against homeschooling. In fact, we support homeschooling. And we have seen excellent children being raised through homeschooling. But for the parents who are working class parents who do not have the opportunity to homeschool their children, then you are, you are in a serious business of ensuring that your children, they understand, they understand Islam from the house. Take them to the mosque. Take them to classes. I mean, a Muslim family, now that, this is another problem in this country. How can you be a dad and a mom and you have children and your children do not know you with a particular gathering where you sit to take Islamic knowledge? There is no Islamic knowledge in your life, in your family. You don't do it in your house. You don't sit. They do not know you that daddy has a sheikh, mommy has a sheikh. Your family has no sheikh. <laughs> Subhanallah. Your family has no class, circle of knowledge, where you take knowledge. We have created the Muslim platform for you. We do fake class on the third Saturdays of the month. We do Umdatul Hakam on the last Saturday of the month. Why can't you stick to that and refer to those two Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Imam and Sheikh Abu Anifa as your Sheikh, so that your children know that you have a teacher that teaches you Islam, so that they see you learning it, so that they can join you in the, in the game. Because if they don't see you learning Islam, it will be difficult for them to also learn. Don't forget, the children do not follow what you say. They follow what you do. Uh, it's not what you say. It is what they see you do. They see you reading Quran, they will grow up reading Quran. They see you praying Salah, they will grow up praying Salah. They don't see you reading the Quran and you're saying, go and read your Quran. They will not know it uh, to read the Quran properly. Oh, go and make your Salah. They don't see you praying. They won't do it properly. The children don't follow what you say they follow what you do. And that's a beautiful concept to take away. So the teaching of Islamic knowledge, the Islamic etiquette, the Islamic personality must be from the house. That would help them, those of them that we cannot homeschool, 
to navigate through what is halal and haram when they are learning them from the school. So the children they will come back and say, you know what, dad, they were teaching us these today and I think it's haram. I could not watch it. I told the teacher I don't want it. I don't want it. And I was excused. When the child knows what is halal, what is haram. And that's why we say practically to some Muslim parents, we need to allow our parents to be exposed to things so that they can know what is halal and what is haram. Not making everything blank. Because if you blank it in the house, Go out and see it. Problem is, they might not even know how to identify that those things are haram. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Over to you, Tawfiq. Um, Barakallahu Sheikh Sheikh. Um, because of time, I'll combine the last couple questions that I've come through, and they just pertain to salah and how we can encourage the children who might frown when you call them to salah. Um, yeah, how, how do we encourage them to start uh, praying if they're not already doing so? Um, how do we balance the induction from the Prophet to kind of to reprimand them if we reach a certain age and they're not and they're not yet praying? How do we balance this based off of the advice you've given already? So um, if you are praying parents in the house, you've been praying, your mom prays, dad prays, and the children are not praying, then we need to check your interaction with them. Because most of the time, what you see with the children is they imbibe, they emulate as a child from childhood, they emulate. You could, you could have seen videos of babies doing that. Something will be wrong in the configuration of that family. And from experience of dealing with families for over 20 years, I know very well that something is wrong in that family configuration. It might be that maybe the dad and the mom do not pray in their presence, number one. Or they do not call them to join the solar at the younger stage. They've grown up before they are now commanding them to pray. They've grown up, up before they start commanding them to pray. That might be the problem. So I would advise that the parents make dua for them. They take them to their teachers. So the shiuch. So for example, in my family, for example, we have many shiuch in our family, many teachers that my wife, my children, they know that these are our shiuch, our sheikh that we listen to. Who is your sheikh in your house? Who is daddy sheikh? Who is mommy sheikh? Which class of knowledge do you belong to? Where do you learn with the children together? And that's the challenge for the Muslim Nigerian Muslim communities. We are taking our children to environment where they are not really learning the deen. They are learning how to pray. And it, it's, it's the truth. They are not learning the team. They are learning how to pray. And there's a difference between making dua oh Allah, and all the workers. Don't forget, those workers don't go with those kids anymore, you know? Because if they go to the church in central London and they play the beat for them, they will jump on that beat more than the worker. Yes, and that's why today, the Muslim children are becoming Christians. Because it's not the music that we need to teach our children. It is the understanding of religion that we need to teach them. The oneness of God, we start from there. The solar, the fasting. We make sure that they grow into that. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this submission something that will be useful Amen. for us, the speaker and the listeners, and to make all our children coolness of our eyes and to help us in our journey of supporting them to grow into be, you know, independent adults. And to make us as well, we that we are children to our parents, to make us useful to them here in this world and when they pass away. And to us as well, to make our children good, excellent children upon the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Aqulu qul aada wa astagfula li wa lakum. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya Tawfiq. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakla wa fiqh, Sheikh, for your for your time today. Just a final reminder, I'm sharing uh, my screen to show um, some of the appeal that we are working on uh, in order to fund some of the initiatives we have. Uh, for instance, we have the Dean House School where inshallah we want to be able to have these facilities to teach our children uh, Islam. Uh, we have um, some of the other initiatives we have around career mentoring, etc., that we'd like to uh, establish. So inshallah, any support you're able to, to give uh, to the, these courses uh, will be much appreciated. And we ask that Allah accepts it from you. Barakallahu uh, feek for attending. As the Sheikh mentioned, we have programs on every single week. 
inshallah on the weekend so if you're not yet part of the whatsapp group please speak to one of your friends who might have invited you to this uh, lecture in order to be uh, placed on the whatsapp group so that you're kept up to date with all the programs that we have uh, coming up subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh